love that the Bible describes in the Old Testament was described as God's loving kindness. You see that phrase over and over again, God's loving kindness. The Hebrew word is hesed. It just means love, but coupled with commitment. Isn't God faithful to us? Aren't you grateful for that? He's just, we can praise him for that. He's just so, he's just so faithful to us. And this is why uh, the Bible begins as it does with the story of God making a commitment to Adam and Eve and even though they sinned and were kicked out of the garden, really the expression of God's discipline to them was him being faithful to his word. What happened was exactly what he said he's happened. It was so, so faithful. And God started again with a new human race uh, with the flood and he gave the rainbow as a promise of his faithfulness that it would never flood again. And although we've been, you know, close in Arkansas in the spring, um, he hasn't done it. He's been so, so faithful. And then what God does next is something remarkable. He gathers his own people, but they're not just a people, they're what we call a covenant people. And a covenant, you think of a promise or a contract, but this is different because a covenant can only be initiated by God. And this covenant initiated by God comes with it the very character of God. And so the covenant is as good as God is. He's just so faithful. And God made this covenant promise to someone named Abraham that he would bless him and give him this amazing nation. And God even prophesied early, warned him early, this wasn't going to take place soon. And sure enough, you know what happened. Abraham's family prospered. They wound up in Egypt. Hundreds of years in Egypt. Finally, they get out of there. And the reason why they were delivered is because God was so faithful. And it just makes sense that a faithful God calls us to be faithful. And that's where we find the people when they're in Egypt. They're there, and they need a leader to lead them out. And God calls someone named Moses. And take your Bibles and turn to Hebrews chapter 3. And Hebrews chapter 3 gives us a little bit of the story of the faithfulness of Moses, but it's a backdrop so that we could see the faithfulness of God to us through the person of Jesus. It's the superior, it's what Hebrews 3 is about, the superior faithfulness of Jesus. And so look at Hebrews chapter 3, look at verse 1, therefore, holy brothers, this is important, it's family language, the word brothers there is actually gender neutral, the word brothers isn't always that the way, but here it is, it's like saying siblings, family members, holy family members, you who share in the heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him, who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. Now, what made Moses so faithful? We're going to look at the faithfulness of Jesus. Let's look at the faithfulness of Moses. What made Moses so faithful? Well, to the audience, the original audience to which this was written, um, they would have had a clear sense of the faithfulness of Moses. Moses was probably the greatest leader in all the Bible, maybe one of the greatest leaders in human history. But what's remarkable about that is even though he was such a profound leader, Uh, Moses did not have any gift for public speaking. That's a problem, right, if you're called to be a leader of hundreds of thousands of people. In fact, he was scared to speak for people publicly. His first assignment was to go and represent himself, be an ambassador, if you will, in front of Pharaoh back in a country where he was a known murderer. And not only that, right on the outset, God told him, I'm calling you to lead a people who aren't going to want to be led encouraging, isn't it? And sure enough, Moses faced opposition from all sides. So what made Moses great was not the fact that he had this raw capacity for leadership. What made Moses great as a leader was just this. It was his, it was his profound faithfulness. It was his faithfulness. Over Christmas, Ashley gave me what may be the definitive biography of George Washington. I've set it on my nightstand, you know, like you do with good books, and they just taunt you there, like, sure, read me. I dare you if you want to. It's about 900 pages, so I'm going to finish it sometime in 2035, but that's not the point. The point is I started the book, and uh, so Washington now is in his early 20s, and so by the way, Washington illustrations, the next 30 years, that's what you're getting uh, until I finish this book. So now he's in his early 20s. He's gone out on three skirmishes, and here's what's interesting. None of his skirmishes have been famously successful. There's nothing about his leadership or military prowess where he's pulled off something really remarkable. 
And yet he's getting this great reputation. Now here's why. In his last skirmish he sent, he's actually serving under a general that has come over. They're fighting the French and Indians, of course. And he's serving under this general. And he's telling this general, look, the Indians and the French, there's a different warfare here than there is on the, the European continent where you fight in lines. Here they fight in ambush. The general didn't believe him. And as they're traveling from Virginia to Ohio to have this uh, fight, to have this battle, uh, he gets sick, deathly sick. He gets laid in the back of a wagon uh, traveling over this really rough terrain, which almost makes him worse. He couldn't ride on horseback. He couldn't lay down on the wagon. There are no roads. They're cutting swaths here. They're actually cutting down trees to make a way for their things, following streams and rivers, building bridges over the streams and rivers and all these type of things. That's how they're getting there. He said to the general, look, at least 24 hours before the fight, would you please wake me up? And the general did. And about that time, Washington was able to mount a horse and get ready for this fight. He could actually take on the enemy. But the fight never happened. Because before they got to the battle, just as Washington thought would happen, the Indians jumped out, they ambushed him, and this first skirmish here of this campaign lasted over 12 hours. Washington had his horse shot out from underneath him, grabbed another horse, he had his horse shot out from underneath him again, and he just kept going, fought for 12 hours, and at the end of the 12 hours... The general said to him, look, we lost this one. We need reinforcements. 40 miles back, there's reinforcements. So Washington rode through the night after fighting for 12 hours, after being sick for months. He rode all the way on horseback, all the way back to get this enemy. He was absolutely exhausted. So even though they didn't necessarily win that fight, what made Washington have this great reputation was he had this incredible inability to die. He just, he just wouldn't get killed. In fact, the French and Indians noticed it. He's riding on the battlefield there for 12 hours. People are being killed. His horse is getting killed out of nothing. He just has this ability to stay alive. In other words, what distinguished him was he was just so faithful. There's a helpful analogy there. We think of the early pioneer days of America, the Revolutionary War, and all these type of things. And here we have one of our first generals who we call the father of our country who's setting the pace and really in many respects kind of embodies the American spirit. And in that microcosm, we have a better sense really of Moses, who was to these people their pioneer, their leader, not distinguished for raw finesse or leadership capabilities, but rather distinguished for his faithfulness. Whatever the Lord asked him to do, that's what he did. And so, a very faithful person is a great backdrop for a comparison to the most ultimately famous person, and that is Jesus. And so this passage of scripture is actually telling us to do something. Look at verse one, chapter three, verse one. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus. That's a verb, it's an action verb. He's saying, I want you to stop, I want you to think about this. It's a command, an imperative. And so the command here is to think certain specific thoughts about Jesus. Here it is, the apostle and high priest of our confession. It's a very interesting title. What is an apostle? Well, an apostle is someone, think of communication. They've got a word, they've got to deliver. An apostle is someone who's a preacher, but also in a sense they were a pioneer. They were someone who was trailblazing and establishing things. Jesus already called in verse 10, the founder of our salvation. So there's a sense in which Jesus here is bringing a message from God to us, communication. But not only the apostle, he's also the high priest. Now, what is a priest? Well, priest in a sense, the opposite of that. While an apostle represents someone to give us a message, a priest represents us before God. Jesus was an apostle in so much as he left God and representing God gave us a message, but he's also a high priest in so much as he left us and went as in representing us before God. So an apostle, think of the word communication. When you think of high priest, think of the word intercession. He's a go-between. Jesus is an apostle. He goes to God. He goes from God to us. But he's also a high priest. He goes to us or he goes to God on behalf of us. So is the apostle and the high priest of our confession. Look at verse 2. Who was faithful to him who appointed him just as Moses also was faithful in all of God's house. And so to help us understand the faithfulness of Jesus... He compares it to the faithfulness of Moses. And to help us understand how this comparison works, he gives two really simple word pictures that both involve a house. And here's the first point of comparison. 
Moses is a key part in God's house. Think God's house as his work, his kingdom. Specifically here, the nation of Israel, but we're grafted into this, so God's work. Moses is a key part of our faith. But while Moses is a key part of the house, God, Jesus is the one who created the entire house. Look at verse 3. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more glory than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. You could drive around Little Rock and find a beautiful million, multi-million dollar home, and you could look at how fascinating it was and beautiful it was, or let's take the analogy even further. Imagine going uh, to the house that uh, the Vanderbilts uh, built, the great mansion there uh, in Asheville, North Carolina, the Biltmore. And imagine you go to this massive, massive house that's really essentially an estate, a chateau, a castle. And while you're touring this beautiful house, you find one brick and you just fixate on it. I just want to look at this one brick. And we would say, well, that's It's a great brick. You've made a good choice. You have a good eye uh, for bricks. But look, there's something more amazing, and that's, first of all, just the topography. How would you know where to clear a spot to build this land so that has great views from the inside, but also has great views when you approach it? How would you know the geography to know if the rock surface can actually take and how far down do you going to have to dig to actually plant a foundation big enough to support this type of structure? And what about the architects and what about the engineer and what about the tradesmen? And the big thing about all that, all that that's going on is that someone has to stand over that and coordinate all of that. The house is interesting, but the builder, the designer, that's, that's really what's fascinating. That's the thing that's worthy of glory because the house in itself is inanimate, right? It's just, it's just an object. But the one who stands over it is the intellect, the designer who created all of it. And he's saying Moses, because of his place, has this unique feature, this unique place in the great big plan and history of God. But while there are many bricks, there is only one builder. And so Jesus is even more faithful than Moses. He's an important part of the house. Jesus designed the house, and this is the second argument, verse 4, he created all things. Notice it says that God created all things in verse 4, but he's using God there to describe Christ because the writer of Hebrews has a very high view of Christ, of Jesus. He's comparing him, of course, and making him equal to God. So Jesus is more faithful than Moses. He's more faithful because although Moses is an important part of God's house, Jesus designed the entire house. But here's the second reason. Moses is an important servant inside God's house, but Jesus is the son over the house. Look at verse 5. Now Moses was faithful in, that preposition is, is very important, in all God's house as a servant. So whatever God put him responsible for, he was faithful. He served inside the house. But Christ, verse 6, is faithful over God's house. Another very important preposition. So Moses faithful in the house. Jesus faithful over the house. Because really, he, as a servant Moses, could never take over or transplant the role of the son. That made perfect sense in first century Middle Eastern culture. You had servants inside your house. They were always working. They were very important. They were valuable. But these servants could never, could never take the place of a son. This is the point of comparison. Now, it's very interesting how it's explained. Look at verse 5. Now, Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant. Now, how was Moses faithful as a servant? Well, I mean, we could could spend all day here, right? I mean, God met him at a burning bush and said, look, this is how I want you to follow me. And Moses responded. He followed him. I want you to go to Pharaoh. Went to Pharaoh. All the plagues that came upon Egypt. Moses, the one who had to deliver the message that would happen, and actually he was the one who actually was the catalyst that affected the timing of them actually happening. And then they finally get out and they go over the Red Sea, and Moses is the one who God uses to part the waters of the Red Sea, and then they get over, and the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness and all the leadership that that required, and all of that, Moses was this phenomenal leader. But in this verse, verse 6, he's not credited for that. 
He's not credited for what he did as a servant. He's credited for what he said. Look at verse 6 again. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a, or excuse me, verse 5. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant. Watch this, to testify. Now what does that mean to testify? Well, to tell. What did Moses testify, tell, or what did Moses write down? Well, you know, it's, it's the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Those we refer to as the books of Moses. He recorded those. So of all the things that he did, the point here is he wrote some things down. He testified. But look, it even means something more specific. Look at verse 5. Now, Moses was faithful to all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. Now, that's an odd phrase. Moses testified, he recorded all the things, but that really were going to be spoken later. Well, that kind of begs the question, spoken by whom? Well, look at verse 1, chapter 1 and verse 1. Remember this, long ago and at many times in many ways, God spoke to our fathers, that would include Moses, by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by whom? By his son. So, a more faithful reading or more accurate reading of verse 5 would be, now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to record all of these things that later would be explained by Jesus. And say, what gives you that reading? Well, there's a hint in verse 6. It says, look at verse 6, but Christ is faithful over God's house. Now, this is the first time in the book of Hebrews that the writer does not use his name He uses his title. Look at verse 1. Consider Jesus. We're thinking about Jesus right now. He uses the word Jesus in verse 1, but later down in verse 6, he uses Christ. Now, we refer to Jesus Christ. We say that a lot. Um, You know this, but we have to remind ourselves that that wasn't necessarily one name. Christ was not Jesus' last name. Like you have two names, Jesus had two names. That wasn't what was going on. His given name was Yeshua, Hebrew word Yeshua, Joshua. The Greek way of saying that was to say Jesus, just his given name, what he was called by his friends and family. The word Christ is a Greek way of saying the Hebrew word that meant Messiah. So when you say the word Jesus Christ or the words Jesus Christ, you make a massive theological statement. And what you're saying is the first century Jewish peasant named Jesus is actually the Messiah that was prophesied long ago from all the Hebrew scriptures. And so here he doesn't use his name, if you will, he uses his title. His title, that's a descriptor, that's a descriptor of what he did. Now the significance of that in verse 6 tied into verse 5, put all that together, So what he's saying is, now Moses was faithful to record all the things that Jesus would later explain that really pertain to him. Take your Bible, look at Luke chapter 24, if you would, Luke chapter 24. It's good to turn to Luke 24 every once in a while because it helps us understand how to read our New Testaments. Look at Luke chapter 24 and verse 25. Luke 24, verse 25. Very important passage of Scripture when it comes to how to read and understand the Bible. So when this is taking place in Luke 24, Jesus has died on the cross. He's risen again. He has not yet ascended to the Father. So it's the period after his resurrection, but before his ascension. And during that time, he takes time to teach his disciples. Verse 25, and he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. That's an amazing statement. Jesus spent three years with his disciples. Time's up. He's about to be ascended back to his father. (laughs) anything he's going to say to them he should have already said it and he's got one parting criticism one thing he chides them for and this is like a one problem with you guys you don't know your bibles now that's bad news because they're going to write the new testament right this is bad for all of us and so before they write the new testament jesus has to give them a lesson in the science of interpretation 
He's going to teach them how to read their Bibles. Look at verse 26. Was it not necessary that the Christ, interesting, the Messiah, the title there, not the name, the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? In other words, put that together, he's saying, you should have gotten from your Old Testament the crucifixion, the resurrection. All the things that I've experienced, you should have understood that just from reading your Bibles. Watch this, verse 27. This is remarkable. And beginning with, here's the significance of this, Moses. First five books of the Old Testament. Beginning with Moses, but in all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And so maybe you're reading your Bible and you thought, isn't it interesting how this Old Testament text kind of fits into the New Testament? Why does that seem to be the case? Well, it all goes probably back here to this conversation when Jesus said, okay, look, let me take a few minutes and I'm going to explain to you how to read the Old Testament. I am all over the Old Testament. It's one book, the Old and New, and I want to show you how all this fits together. Look at verse 44. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me, here it is again, in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms might be fulfilled. The reason why I've done all these things to fulfill all the prophecies that were said about the Messiah, even the ones spoken by Moses from long ago. Now, what kind of things do you think Jesus explained to them in that moment? We don't know. We'd love to know. We don't know. Let's speculate for a second. Maybe Jesus said, look, hey guys, remember Genesis chapter 3? You know the story from the time you are little bitty boys. Adam and Eve were driven out of the garden. There was curses on the ground, on Adam and Eve and on the snake. And when God cursed the snake, he said, look, this snake is going to bruise the heel of the woman, but the seed of the woman is going to come bruise the head of the serpent. That's just not about a serpent and a seed. That's a statement about me, the fact that I'm going to come and Satan's always going to be at my heels. He's always going to be at your heels. But don't worry, one day I'm going to come back and I'm going to bruise the head of the serpent and I'm going to rule over all things. That's about me. That's about me. Oh, by the way, Genesis chapter 9, Moses, Noah makes this fire and the, the fire goes up as a sweet-smelling, satisfying savor to God. What was satisfying to God about this burning sacrifice on the altar? Well, actually, that was a picture, a hint, a clue, a shadow of something that's going to come later, that when I'm sacrificed on the cross, the fact that I gave my life is satisfying the wrath of God on your behalf, and because of my sacrifice, God is satisfied. Or maybe explicitly he took them to Exodus and said, look, the whole reason that there was a lamb and that lamb had to be killed and that blood had to be put over the doorpost was to help you understand that I am the lamb of God and I'm going to lay my life down for my people and my blood is placed over the doorpost of your hearts. You can have acceptance of God and the death angel passes over you, not because there's anything special about that lamb, because rather it's a picture, it's a picture of me. It's a picture of me. So Moses was faithful as this incredible verbal architect to build these really important rooms in our faith, if you will. But Jesus, he is the one who executed the entire plan. (laughs) Moses is faithful, but Jesus is ultimately faithful. So, verse 1, he says, I want you to think about this. Fixate on this for a minute. Consider this. Turn this over in your mind. Think about this. Moses was faithful part of God's house, but Jesus built the whole house. And Moses was a faithful servant to record these things. Jesus actually executed these things. He was the son over the entire house. And then look how he ends. This is very interesting. Hebrews chapter 6. Look at the last sentence. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. Listen to this. And we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. We are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. This passage of scripture uh, makes 
Christians in general nervous, and it makes Baptists specifically nervous because of the word if right there. It sounds like a condition, right? That if we do certain things, God will respond in certain ways. And you say, Pastor, you're a fourth generation Baptist preacher. Can't you explain that away to make it sound like it doesn't really mean what it says it means? And the answer is, no, I can't. It just says what it says. We are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting and our hope. What's our confidence? In this context, it's just, it's our faithfulness. Well, how are you supposed to understand this? Now, listen very carefully. This is so important. Let me make two statements. The first one is this. No one will be saved who does not endure. No one will be saved who does not persevere. No one will be saved who doesn't hold fast their confidence. This is the first statement. The second statement is this, not one of us has the ability to persevere outside of Christ. So you're comfortable with the statement, you'll only be saved if you endure. Sure, that's exactly what the text says. But remember, the fixation and the focus, what we're supposed to think about is not ourselves. Look, consider Jesus. The point is not what we can do in our endurance, the point is what Christ has done. Look, we're holy brothers. In other words, we have the spiritual DNA of Christ. And so when I make the statement, look, no one will be saved who is an endure, that's not a statement of, hey, y'all better endure. It's this statement. It's saying, look, the power of Jesus is so real. The faithfulness of Jesus is so superior that if someone is in Christ and they are in him, it's so powerful, he will cause them to endure. It's a statement of how powerful Jesus is. And so really, the way this paragraph is structured, verses 1 through 3, it's like a major command and one that's subordinate to it. The first one is this, consider Jesus, think about the faithfulness of Jesus. And then he comes back behind that and says, hey, based upon the faithfulness of Jesus, and we talk about salvation, but this really isn't about salvation, we're going to get into that next week, it's really something more practical. Fixate focus on Jesus. And he turns to them and says, look, um... Don't, don't give up. Don't, don't lay down. Get off the fence. Come on. Come on. You had a great week. Crushed everything. I hope you did. You had a horrible week. Lots of mistakes, lots of failures. I understand that, I get that, I can relate to that. Now, come on. Come on. Don't don't trifle with this, is what he's saying. Let's go. Let's go. I found out about a month ago uh, that a guy that I'd led to the Lord when I was in my maybe mid-twenties, was a pastor, just got radically saved that he had gone on to be with the Lord, and my friend Greg was a lineman for Virginia Power. He would climb telephone poles, and he had a crew that did the same. He did it for many years, and he was tough. He was so tough. And I remember two things that he would say to me. Uh, he would say, Pastor, I just, when my crew that I've got out, you know, in a thunderstorm, electrical storm, I got my crew out there, we're doing something tough. I just got to make sure they don't lay down. I'll never forget that phrase. You can't lay down. Come on. Got to get with it. And the second thing he said, he said, sometimes on my guys, on my crew, I have guys who complain. I would always say to them the same thing. I say, you want some cheese with that wine? You ever heard that one? I never heard that one. It's a good one. Want some cheese with that wine? So, it's, it's tough following Christ. It's hard following Jesus. And this passage comes alongside us and says, I want you to think and focus and fixate on the incredible faithfulness of Jesus. Are you seeing it there? All right, now be faithful. Let's go. Come on. That's what he's saying to us. Take your Bible, if you would, and look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And I want to read a very familiar passage of Scripture. Romans chapter 8. Look at verse 31. Romans chapter 8 and verse 31. Verse 31. 
Romans 8, 31. Uh, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, isn't this encouraging? Who can be against us? He's so faithful. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? In Romans 8, some have referred to as the most important chapter in all the Bible. It's important really for that question. Who can condemn you? To which you might be thinking, who can't condemn me? I've got a long list, Pastor. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? But ultimately, it is God who justifies. Who is it to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that was raised. Who is at the right hand of God. Who indeed is interceding for us. This is just one of those verses you got to turn to over and over again. Because you just don't think it's real. But it's real. Remember intercession. This is the high priest function. So when Jesus Christ was here on earth, his primary function was an apostolic one. He was teaching. He was pioneering. He was establishing things. That was his primary function. But now in heaven, at the right hand of the Father, receiving heavenly reward, his primary function is an intercessory one. He's functioning as the high priest, which is very significant because Revelation chapter 12 and verse 10 calls Satan the accuser of the brethren. It says that Satan is before the throne of God day and night, bringing accusations accusation against you and bringing accusation against me. So here's the scene that's taking place right now. All the reasons that I've given God to condemn me, Satan reminds God of perpetually. I'm going to condemn and condemn and condemn and accuse and accuse and we would be ruined if Christ the high priest were not standing there in our defense. He intercedes for us. About, I don't know, maybe a dozen years ago or so, and the second wave of the Gulf War was in the Atlanta airport. And so if you've been to this airport, you know it's two massive terminals. They come together in one hub and there's retail and shops and all these kind of things and restaurants. And there's a USO there. And when the soldiers um, are coming there to be sent out, they stage there at the USO and they start this tradition. A, a veteran of war would come and would lead these men and women out and say, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you, and he would list the armed services that were represented there, and then everybody would applaud. The baristas would stop what they were doing, the vendors would stop what they were doing, everybody would turn and they would applaud. We pretended we weren't crying, but we were, and everybody would look and just gawk at these soldiers. Now, why were we applauding for them? Well. It wasn't because the war was over. <laughs> well, the war was far from over. That's not why we were plotting. We were plotting because while we were grateful they had the leave, while we were grateful they had the time off, what I was most grateful for than anything <laughs> is that they were going back. And because they were there, I, I didn't have to be. And those of us who don't have the skills and the capacity to fight wars, are protected far, far away by those who do have the capacity to fight the wars. Jesus, in a sense, had a first tour of duty. It was in a tour as an apostle. It was confession and communication. And the reason why we worship him and praise him today is not just because he came as a baby, as incredible as that is, Philippians chapter 2, that he would wrap himself in flesh. It was not just that he would live a sinful life, as remarkable as that is, because we're not just saved by the death of Christ, but by the life of Christ. It's not that he would just endure the torture and shame and embarrassment and pain of the cross, although we're so grateful to Jesus that he did. And it's not just that he would overcome the grave by rising from the dead, although we praise him for the dead. What we praise him for is his second tour of duty, where he's right now, before the throne of the Father and he's praying for us. He's praying for us. So the point of the text is simply this. Praise Jesus because he was faithful. Hey, listen, listen. But praise Jesus because he is faithful in this moment. So, so be faithful. Be faithful because we follow the one who is faithful. Father God, we are grateful for your love. Father, we thank you for this just clear call to love Jesus because of his faithfulness toward us. Father God, I pray that your grace would superintend all that we 
do in this moment. And so we're sitting here now with heads bowed and eyes closed. And right now there's an internal struggle going on in some hearts right now. And it's because there's something that God is calling you just to let go of. It's a habit. It's a relationship. It's a thought. It's a potential to do something. You know it's not right. God knows that you know it. You just, you haven't decided yet. And this morning, Hebrews 3 is telling us, listen to me, Hebrews 3 is telling you, get off the fence. Jesus is on the wall, so we get off the fence. Maybe God is calling you to put a habit in your life and you've believed the enemy's lies that you're just kind of as good as you're ever going to be. But the truth of the matter is, is that there's so much more and it's on the other side of just embracing the habit, the identity of being a believer in Christ. And you maybe have wanted 2 Corinthians 5, 17, old things are passed away, all things have become new. You've wanted that to be passively true, but not actively true. And this morning is a call for faithfulness, for faithfulness. Now, that's true. All things have become made new. Now, be faithful. <laughs> Come on. Come on, it's a new day. It's a new day. For others, it's just that very first step of faith. You haven't stepped out and said, look, uh, I'm giving my heart and life to Christ. No turning back. Not gonna waver, not gonna waffle about this. I wanna give my life to Christ. And if that's the case, you just tell him that right now. Tell him you wanna turn from your sin. Follow him and give your life to him. Do that right now. Others need to join this church. You've thought about it. Toyed around with it. It's time, you know that it's time. And whatever thing that you want to pray about or think about, our pastors are going to be here at the front. would love to visit with you about anything you want to talk about or pray about. Whatever it is, you just step out and you just come. Father God, we love you. And Lord, we ask in Jesus' name that your Holy Spirit would move in this place and we'd be responsive, Father. And we pray it because of him. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. If God is needing you to come, wherever you are, you just step out. You just come.